Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Now, who's next? Mr. Anderson, so you're sitting there in agony. Come on, Todd, step up. Let's put you out of your misery. I, I didn't do it. I didn't write a poem. Mr. Anderson thinks that everything inside of him is worthless and embarrassing. Isn't that right, Todd? And that's your worst fear. Well, I think you're wrong. I think you have something inside of you that is worth a great deal. I sound my barbaric yop. don't know, a yelp is a loud cry or yell. Now, Todd, I would like you to give us a demonstration of a barbaric yelp. <laughs> come on, you can't yelp sitting down. Let's go. Come on, up. Gotta get in yelping stance. Uh, a yelp. No, not just a yelp. A barbaric yelp. <laughs> yelp. Come on, louder. Yelp. Oh, that's a mouse. Come on, louder. Yo, oh, good God, boy, yell like that! There it is. Well, it's really uh, nice to be here and fun to, to share the stage here with uh, Professor Brown. I, I don't often get a chance to talk in an academic setting about uh, things that are close to my heart, take off my professor hat, and uh, think about big questions. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Brown is a philosopher, and so that's his stock and trade, thinking about big questions. And so I appreciate the opportunity to have some fun dialogue tonight. But one of the best things about college is the opportunity to ask big questions, to sit around in the dorm lounge with your friends and ponder deep things like, what should I do with my life? Why is love so powerful? And did The Hobbit really need to be three parts? <laughs> For me, I began to ask big questions in the face of, of uh, in, in college. By the way, that's me with hair. <laughs> I began to ask big questions uh, in college uh, in the face of great turmoil. As I headed off to college, my father had cancer. My mother had ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. And so they were both battling life-threatening illnesses. My parents had raised me to prize education but suddenly school seemed meaningless. What is the point of learning, I asked, if we live and die and that's it? Why am I trying so hard to achieve? How will that help my parents? Does success bring anything meaningful? I realized I could no longer be agnostic on the big questions of life. Wrestling with these questions led me to consider the Christian faith. Yes, I was depressed. Perhaps Christianity is just a crutch for the weak-minded. Perhaps faith is just wishful thinking. But in college, I met intelligent people who, surprisingly, were Christian. I learned that believing scientists throughout history saw no difficulty reconciling science with the Christian worldview. And I discovered that turning to Jesus is not an intellectual cop-out, but gives ultimate meaning to both my personal life and my academic pursuits. I wrestled with big questions. And we tend to do that when our lives are in a mess. A student was sobbing in my office. She had confessed to cheating. I was not to be her judge. Her conscience was already doing that, as evidenced by her muffled sobs. Rather, I saw my role to be her advocate and her friend, to help her think through her underlying motivations. So I said, when I do something that I shouldn't, it's because I've made something so supremely important that I think, if I could just have that, then I could be happy. When you cheated, what did you feel you had to have? 
she said, I felt I needed a good grade. And I said, what's behind your desire for a good grade? I'm tired of feeling like I'm surrounded by all these smart people and I'm just average. I want to be seen as smart. Now, I have compassion on her because I've felt that pressure too. After a pause, she added, I really did wrestle with the problem, but I was tired and I had so much other work to do, so I just looked for a solution online. I just wasn't sure I'd get the problem if I kept at it. Now the irony is that now she'll never know if she would have solved the problem. She's just reinforced the very insecurity she was trying to destroy. This was not an isolated incident. There were several others who cheated, and one by one I probed why they too were tempted. In each case, there was something that they felt they had to have to be happy. The acclaim of peers, the approval of parents, admission to a top graduate school, landing a good job. And why do you want a good job, I asked. Because then I will have a good life. I asked, what makes life good? Big question. After this, I had a conversation with my entire class, and I told them, I, I would be failing you as a teacher if you came away from my class thinking that grades were a measure of your self-worth, or if you felt your dignity came from your performance. And a student came up to me after class and asked, then where does our dignity come from? Big question. Does your dignity come from achievement? After winning his third Super Bowl, Tom Brady, Patriots quarterback, said in a 60 Minutes interview, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I've reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. The interviewer asked, what, what's the answer? Brady, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. This from a guy who just won his fourth Super Bowl and is married to a supermodel. Our society has made achievement an idol. An idol is anything you justify your life by, anything you feel you must have in order to be happy. In other words, something you worship. Our society worships achievement, perfect resumes, perfect bodies, perfect finances, in the quest for a perfect life. It's no surprise then that we pay doctors, supermodels, hedge fund managers hefty salaries. Our society works all the time. We feel an insane pressure to perform. We constantly compare ourselves to other people, asking, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I buff enough? And we can't be happy for another person's success. These are all clues that we've made achievement an idol. Have you ever felt any of these things? It is a never-ending rat race that ultimately leaves us all falling short. So if achievement is the basis of our dignity, we ironically can't achieve it. And when we fall short, we begin to choose image over substance. I confess I would rather people think I have a good life than work to figure out what makes life good. Just look at my Facebook profile. So it is tempting to take shortcuts, like padding your resume with 10 extracurriculars rather than investing in one truly meaningful activity, or cheating on an assignment rather than engaging in the productive struggle where the true learning happens. In the news recently, a prominent news anchor who exaggerated his record as a war journalist provides another example of shortcuts. Now, here is the good news. Your achievements are not the basis of your dignity. Your achievements are not the basis of your dignity. Understanding this would change the way you think about everything, including your education. You could look at grades differently as just an imperfect tool to assess your learning. There would be no shame in failure. You would not be afraid to make mistakes. You could have freedom from the burden of performance. But if achievements are not the basis of our dignity, what then is the basis for our dignity? Most people dignify what they worship. They choose idols. 
Some feel their dignity comes from beauty, but as beauty fades, so will that apparent dignity. Some feel dignity comes from money, but money doesn't buy happiness. The idols of our heart will never bring lasting dignity. But perhaps dignity doesn't have to be grounded in anything. Perhaps we can just declare that all humans must have dignity. But then how do I decide between competing claims about where dignity comes from? So, for instance, we say one thing but do another. Like when I say, we're all equal in worth, but then I pay more attention to the rich person than the poor person. Or when I say, all my students deserve dignity, but I only talk with the A students. Which claim has authority? Despite what we may say, dignity is always grounded in something you make ultimate. As a Christian, I believe we have a fundamental dignity grounded in God's love for us and not for anything we do. Let me emphasize again, the reason God loves you doesn't come from you or anything you do. Being moral or accomplished does not make God love you more. And this is good news. You can mess up and your dignity will not be tarnished. You can be unremarkable to the world, but yet you will still have dignity before God. And if you believe this, you will no longer be slaves to achievement. You can seek to be a doctor or a gardener purely because you're passionate about these things. You can fail without letting it define who you are. You can celebrate achievement without letting it get to your head because we recognize that achievement, as well as the skills that produce the achievement, are simply gifts of grace from a loving God. How can I believe that I have this fundamental dignity when the world tells me otherwise? That's been a journey for me. In college, I made achievement an idol. Even with my family turmoil, I worked my tail off, flying through as a top math student. But I got to grad school at Harvard and met people who were way better than me in what I thought I was the best at. And as a result, I felt threatened. Two professors changed my perspective. My first professor was my research advisor. He only spoke to me about work. He never showed any interest in me as a person. And when I made no progress on my research problem, said in a mean-spirited way, you don't have what it takes to be a successful mathematician. Second professor taught one of my classes. This guy would chat with me when we passed in the hallway, though he barely knew me. When my mother died, he told me how sorry he was. And then he took me out to, for coffee and a comforting conversation. Now, which one do you think I wanted to learn from? The first professor destroyed my idea of finding my dignity and my accomplishments. And for that, I, I should probably thank him. I told the second professor that I thought about quitting, and he said, I'd rather you work with me than see you quit. And that was an amazing, unearned favor that wasn't based on accomplishments, because I, I had no accomplishments. Christians have a word for that, and that's the word grace. Grace is good things you didn't earn or deserve, but you're getting them anyways. And when somebody shows you grace, you realize you have a dignity that doesn't come from your accomplishments. This is why Jesus, to me, is such a compelling figure. Because Jesus is the epitome of grace. He hung out with the social outcasts and the prostitutes and the widows. And he shunned the religious elite and the morally accomplished. So we know we don't need to be perfect to be loved by him. And most remarkably, Jesus bore the judgment for our misdeeds upon himself. So you can mess up and God renders you forgiven and worthy. That's grace. Now, what does this have to do with education? Well, when you have a teacher that is a grace giver, you have freedom. You have freedom because you can make mistakes and fail. You can learn through the struggle, and you don't have to worry that your teacher will look at you differently. Your teacher can give you hard feedback on your assignments, and you will still know that your failure on this assignment doesn't define you. A grace giver gives you dignity you don't have to earn. Think of the movie. Mr. Anderson thinks everything inside him is worthless. Isn't that right, Todd? I think you're wrong. I think you have something inside you that is worth a great deal. 
When you realize your dignity doesn't come from your achievements, you can get up in front of a class and make a fool of yourself. Sound your barbaric yop over the rooftops of the world. And when you realize your dignity does, comes from being loved by God, that will change the way you view the world and your education. A dignity based on an idol, like achievements, beauty, money, will ultimately fail. But a dignity that comes from the love and grace of a person has rich consequences. You begin to love that person. You begin to value who that person values. You study the things that person makes. This is the fire behind our desire to study the physical world if you're a scientist, or the human creative world if you're in the hearts and the humanities, or the beauty in the patterns of the world if you're a mathematician like myself. You begin to care about the things that person cares about. Justice, if you're in the social sciences. Human flourishing, if you are in business or engineering. Now, of course, you don't have to be a Christian to want to learn about the world. That desire is built into each of us because we have been made in the image of God, all of us. We have this innate curiosity and creativity and the ability to show love to people and show grace to others. But these desires point to a deeper reality that, if we could just see clearly, would keep us from the empty promises of idols, especially the idol of achievement. You can have worthiness apart from your performance. You can have dignity independent of your achievements. Your identity doesn't have to be rooted in your accomplishments. This is good news. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us in the letter to the Galatians, we have freedom. It was freedom for which Christ has set us free. Thank you very much. Well, I asked for advice about whether to keep the hat on or, or take it off and blind you. Um, and uh, <laughs> Joy suggested leaving the hat on because if I took it off, about half of you wouldn't recognize me. Let's see. Oh, it works, thank you uh, for that. Well, um, we're here to talk about the value of education, and um, I'm here as a professor uh, at Cal Poly, uh, an occupation that I certainly wish to hold until I'm no longer physically capable of teaching. They'll probably just put me in a closet somewhere and tell me I'm teaching a class, and I'll be perfectly happy with that. <laughs> Save some money, too, Al, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, however, on this topic, uh, I confess not to be terribly innovative. Uh, my basic idea of education, which I implement in my classes, is pretty simple and definitely stodgy. Read books, think about them, discuss them, and write about them. I would think that this general pedagogy was uh, well in place back when Plato invented the university with his academy. Uh, but for most students at Cal Poly, an education amounts to some form of technical training, the pursuit of which at a comprehensive university affords students a singular occasion also to become an intellectual. But the pressure to succeed in a technical discipline and the aspiration to develop into a well-rounded intellectual, well, those two projects cut directly against each other. At Cal Poly, our technical programs are so rigidly articulated that the only flexibility to be an intellectual, or at least to be an intellectual explorer of some sort, is within the small confines of a few general education courses. In the long haul of the history of universities, this sort of educational model of a nearly entirely highly specialized technical training is very new. And it's starkly different from the classical education, uh, the classical educational model that had been in place since, well, uh, when? Well, I'm going to go back to Friedrich Nietzsche here. Let's take ourselves then back to about 1872, when a certain Friedrich Nietzsche was recently hired as a young professor of classics. He observed the early and significant curricular shifts in universities in the broader German educational system. A university education had long been grounded in extensive study of the classics, broadly construed to cover the whole of the humanities, including history, literature, philosophy, theology, augmented with some science and math. 
Rampant industrialization had shifted educational needs towards more scientific and technical disciplinary education. The secondary educational system in Germanic states split into separate classics oriented schools and more technically oriented schools. The growth rate of new technical schools greatly outpaced the sluggish uh, expansion of the classical schools. Nietzsche considered his task as an educator to buck aspects of this trend to marginalize the classics, and in particular, to keep his students trained in the art of reading, so that they could continue to engage with the great texts that form the background of their culture. Here is a remark from uh, a preface to a lecture that Nietzsche gave on the nature of education in the light of recent changes in university curriculum. So he starts by saying, uh, the reader from whom I expect something must have three qualities. What are these qualities of a reader? He must be calm and read without haste. He mustn't always insert himself and his culture into his reading. That's a particularly challenging point. And finally, he must not expect a concrete result. That is some tables and charts at the end that deliver the whole answer. Someone like this has not yet unlearned how to think. But what's going on today in our educational process, Nietzsche muses? Well, when on the other hand, the greatly agitated reader springs immediately into action and wants to pluck fruits, hard won over many decades and centuries, and pluck them now, then we must fear that he has not understood the author. Well, I agree with Nietzsche on this point, and I aim to help students understand the author and arrest the process of unlearning how to think. Now, Cal Poly is unique amongst polytechnic universities in having two great books courses required in general education, one in literature and one in philosophy. I teach one of those philosophy courses. My methodology assumes as values really basic ideas logical reasoning, careful observation, including especially the reading of texts, and respect for the ancient origins of our culture, mainly in the form of texts. In my general education courses, I teach classic texts that speak to perennial human concerns, and especially ones that I have found to address problems students face and take seriously. The ancient Stoic philosopher Epictetus considers the major problems we face to be traced back to the measuring of value in our lives in terms of a variety of options. Well, he nails them down to four. Our bodies, our possessions, cultivating our reputations, and securing our place in society. He has a general point to make about these things. And the first step to improving your life, according to Epictetus, is to realize this point. These things are not really up to you. Instead, the extent to which you allow what's not up to you to determine what matters in your life is the extent to which you are enslaved to that thing. As for whether to be enslaved or free, well, he lets you answer that for yourself. The Stoics teach that these things have no value beyond what you bestow on them. That is, these things are beyond your control, but you can decide for yourself what value you place on them. It's hard to think that way, but I present models of those who have. Socrates is one of them. Now, I do this not to endorse the philosophy, but to present it as a challenge against the prevailing assumptions of my students. Another presumption my students have is that desire and fear are their primary motivators, and they can't do without them. I have them read another ancient philosopher, Epicurus. He held that desire and fear are the primary diseases of the mind, and that education is their cure. By investigating who we are and the nature of the world in which we live, we can learn which desires are worth satisfying, very few indeed, and which can be merely ignored, almost all of them. We also learn about the things that frighten us, 
which he thought were primarily superstitions about the origins and purpose of natural phenomenon and the specter of our own mortality. The answer to these problems was in a fourfold cure. Nothing that counts as a blessed God, as Epicurus understands it, would ever cause us trouble. That just cuts directly against the concept of being blessed. So don't fear the gods. They don't care about you anyhow. They have bigger fish to fry than your problems. Death? Well, it's nothing. It can't be bad then, because what's bad has to be endured. It's something. If death is nothing, no reason to fear it. Our desires for what's truly good are relatively easy to satisfy, and most of what we think is good isn't really worth desiring at all. The things that you think are so terrible in life end up not being so hard to endure. That is, once you learn to face them without fear, you're causing your own problems by putting fear in front of your face. On this Epicurean view, education in what we would now call science and the humanities quells desire and alleviates fear and gives us our only ho hope of a good life. It's not a surprise his books were burned. Now, I don't endorse this view to my students. I bring them to it as another challenge to their prevailing assumptions and a different one from the Stoic challenge. It's up to the students to decide whether any of these options or none of them are worth their while. Now, Cal Poly used to be a technical high school, but it became a university only because of general education, and in particular, the liberal arts, the humanities. As we become more of a university while preserving our polytechnic purpose, universities in general have become more technical. Achievement in relation to education can define who we are, especially when we value education as a means rather than an end, which perhaps is appropriate at, at a technical institute, at least in the way people actually talk about it. But preserving the liberal arts as the last vestige of the old university augments the otherwise rigidly defined curriculum of our technical programs into a proper university education. I think we should be on guard against turning the liberal arts into quasi-technical programs by evaluating them under the same conditions, lest our connection to our past be buried under those charts and tables Nietzsche thought were not helpful. I'm going to close by saying something about my personal journey from student to educator. It started in high school, and it started with religion, and in particular with my inclination to escape from it. My path of escaping from religion led me right, right into 40s, bongs, coke, acid, and meth. Kicking all that turned me on to chemistry. <laughs> Go figure. I want to know the causes. But then very rapidly to philosophy. What I thought I wanted out of chemistry, in retrospect, I see I could have gotten from studying atomic physics, but I ended up in a philosophy class and found it to be a very natural fit for my own inclinations to reason and think. I have the innate temperament of a philosopher. I'm logical, fearless in my questioning, and I don't need answers. I have an ability to shift effortlessly to ever higher levels of abstraction of thought. Early on, one of my professors, actually an English professor, said this of me. I possessed a talent for getting rapidly to the, es to the essence of a position so as to see it from the inside without necessarily committing to it. I could then move on and do it equally well with another position. I think this is a rare skill and one I learned to appreciate early on. In my teaching, I've come to cherish it and develop it and exploit it, and I, I think to the advantage of my students. Primary application of this skill as a teacher is in teaching the history of philosophy. I think I have a talent for pre presenting a position as if I'm advocating for it, while doing the same for multiple contrary positions. I do this in my history of philosophy classes by presenting many different positions, many of them which seem utterly insane when we try to bring them to us. But I try to motivate each one for the students so that the students can see a reason why they should go back to them. This methodology can be very jarring to students who are used to advocacy, but they don't get it from me, at least when I can avoid it. 
Students end up wondering what my commitments are, expecting that at some point in the course I need to tell them what the right view is. I don't do that. Pedagogically, I think my personal commitments are irrelevant. My purpose is to urge the students to be fair to the texts, especially when they're inclined to reject it. The value of this pedagogy is, I think, for my students, that I help them engage with the positions themselves. That is, I bring them to the texts. I help them be fair to the positions they face so that when they engage with a position, whether to reject it or accept it, or merely to consider it as a position, they do so respectful of what that position is and what its place is in our cultural history. I don't teach concrete results. I strive to encourage careful reading and the understanding of a position from the inside. This pedagogy it has value just as one among many other pedagogies. I don't think my ideas about how I teach should constrain anyone else from developing their ideas about teaching. Everyone should encounter a wide variety of teaching styles. Nevertheless, this one's mine. My contribution to the GE requirements for our students expresses my outlook on the purpose of education, which is very much in line with that ideal expressed by Nietzsche. To help our students as they develop their technical skills to either retain or develop their ability to be calm and careful readers and thinkers. And I do this, I think, by bringing the students to the texts, not the other way around. My ideals are these. Don't insert yourself into the text. Make the text instead become a part of you. And I think in that way, you will not yet unlearn how to think. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brown, for your stimulating presentation. At this time, we will ask questions. Um, I will ask some questions of our speakers and ask the audience to prepare their questions for the next phase of the evening. The we'll put up on the screen a text number so you can begin texting in your questions um, for the speakers during the, pres the rest of the evening. And we'll select some out later on to, to ask the speakers. So first, I'll start with Professor Brown and ask you um, a question. After that, we'll ask Professor Sue to also answer the same question. Within your field of philosophy, what is the dominant worldview? How do you engage with colleagues and students who hold different views? And does this affect your teaching or relationship with students in any way? Just the other day, I was uh, browsing the web and going to one of the major philosophy news blogs. And someone was just throwing up a rather unscientific poll. And the polls were a variety of them. How old are you, you know, male or female, educational background, uh, like where you got your degree and all that. But one of them was, what's your religious affiliation, broken down into many, many different breaks. The overwhelming majority of the people who took this incredibly unscientific poll I think it was 52% as of today, said atheist. With second place being agnostics. Add up all the Christians, they would have been in second place. Just edging the agnostics. Now that's an extreme presentation of what is probably a predominant worldview in philosophy, and that is that it's not a religious discipline. That said, there are plenty of religious universities that are major universities in philosophy, Notre Dame, for instance, many of the Jesuit universities, and uh, those universities usually have a divided faculty. Um, here, plenty of my colleagues are committed uh, to various religions. Uh, I deal with them the way I think I deal with my students. Uh, I have different worldview. Um, that does not mean I need to disrespect theirs. Plenty of people hold positions that I don't understand. Um, there's a difference when I'm dealing with students, though. When I'm dealing with students, I don't want those kinds of positions even to be in the room. But I do think that they have to, in some way, be there. Mm -hmm. I can dare say this. I don't announce my commitments to my students in my classroom, but I don't think they had any difficulty figuring out which person I was on the placard for this event. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Brown. Professor Sue, within your field of mathematics, what is the dominant worldview? 
and how does this uh, affect the way you engage with your students in your teaching? First, let me just say, um, when we talk about worldview uh, within mathematics, I can say something about that, and then I can talk about larger worldview issues such as religion. But within mathematics, uh, you know, in some ways, mathematics is, um, uh, I guess it's like philosophy, because you're often dealing with very abstract ideas. Uh, and uh, in mathematics, uh, there is uh, a philosophical worldview, which I would say is dominant, and that is um, related to the question of whether mathematics is uh, an abstract reality. So are you a, a, a Platonist, for instance? Do you believe that mathematical objects, such as a sphere or a cube or uh, some sort of um, abstract uh, object, do they have an independent reality? Or maybe another question you could, a way to phrase that is, is mathematics invented or discovered? If you encountered um, a, uh, a, uh, some aliens on some distant planet, would they have similar mathematics? Mm. Uh, so there's a, a question, and I would say, um, by and large, most mathematicians, if you ask them the question, is math invented or discovered? Uh, is there an abstract uh, reality to mathematics that's independent of time, space, cultural framework? Um, I, I think most mathematicians would say math is discovered. Um, or they might say math is both invented and discovered because there is a creative aspect to mathematics. When you, you prove a new theorem or, or uh, create a new strategy for solving a problem, that, that's a creative activity. But uh, it, it could also be the case that even though math is created, um, an alien race somewhere on some other planet may uh, have discovered the same multiple paths to a solution. Mm -hmm. And so there is sort of this worldview that I would say is pretty dominant, which is uh, mathematicians are mostly, I would say, Platonists. Now, if you enlarge that, uh, that question, um, I, I guess I, I, should, I, should, I should at least also point out that the fact that mathematicians think about some of these abstract things, um, like uh, objects that exist for all time, they're infinite, they're eternal. Um, it does, for me, as a, as a, as a Christian, um, I, I guess make a lot of sense to me. I, I don't question whether there's an ultimate truth uh, to be known in the universe, because I see that in mathematics. There is truth, it's unchangeable, it doesn't depend on culture, time, or space. Um, but that's not, uh, I would say, shared necessarily by um, in terms of religious worldview by my colleagues. And uh, mathematicians are just as diverse, I think, as, as the general population in terms of their religious worldview. Uh, and in terms of how I relate with my colleagues, I would say very similarly to Ken. I think um, uh, in my department, uh, well, there's lots of different views. I think we're all respectful. Um, with some, I think I can share or talk about um, some of these big questions and have a dialogue like I'm having with Ken. With others, I would say they're, they pretty much want to keep, keep uh, from discussing those things. And then with students, I guess I, I'm also, I agree with Ken, I'm also very careful not to, it should never be the case that a student thinks that they need to earn my favor in some way by uh, telling me their religious perspective. Or they should never fear that I'm going to uh, judge them differently because they have a different religious worldview. And so I'm very, very careful not to, to cross that, that boundary. But if a student brings up, uh, ha brings up some conversation, I'm happy to discuss it. And obviously our worldview shapes the way we do things, the way we teach um, and, uh, and other things. But I, I'm, I, I'm pretty careful to keep those boundaries. And in some sense, tonight, I'm sort of stepping out of that um, in, in, in having this conversation with you guys, which uh, is, I think, uh, an, a lot of fun and an opportunity, but it's not something that I normally do at my school. Thank you. Al, could I add one little point on that? Certainly. The weird irony is that these days there are vastly more Platonists in math departments than philosophy departments. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Why would you say that's the case? Um, Probably because of a kind of anti-mysticism uh, emerging out of the Enlightenment, 
led to a deep suspicion about Plato, seeing him as value f valuable for raising problems, but not as providing answers. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Well, the next question, I'll start with Professor Sue. What advice would you give to others who are on their own quest to find meaning in life? I would say uh, to dig deep and ask big questions. Um, I, I really appreciated what you had to say, Ken, about um, classical education. I think classical education actually helps us to think about not just what technology is, is but what it's good for. What is the purpose of technology? How, are we, how do we be good stewards of this? Uh, and that's fully consonant with my, with my Christian worldview. Dig deep, ask big questions. Um, you, you can't be afraid to, um, you shouldn't be afraid of truth. Search for it, discover uh, what's true. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd follow up on that by saying the, the way that I particularly recommend acknowledging that there are many other paths too, but the one that I would put into the mix is the one I was talking about. Go back to the classics, uh, especially the early ones because the earliest philosophers uh, in particular were fearless about raising questions and had no problem just running their positions right over a cliff. And so what you could do is see what the full logical implications of a position are mm. and see what drove it into the ground. Uh, by seeing a variety of different positions, that can reduce your sense that you have all the answers. Others have probably tried objections against your positions before. It's good to be informed by that. So reading the classics does not mean looking for some piece of wisdom to appropriate, but reading it with the, the idea in mind of finding the problems. Good, thank you. Well, the next question is a long one, and I'll go back to you, Professor Brown. What do you see as the biggest weaknesses in your worldview, either within the context of learning or more broadly, and what is the most difficult aspect of it for you to live out in your daily life? I think the most difficult thing for me to grapple with about it as a worldview is it doesn't feel like one. Um, my position, if it, it, I'm, I'm here under the label of being an atheist, mm -hmm which is a fair label, but it's not anything that's meaningful or significant to me as any sort of positive commitment in my life. It's instead what's left after something else that I had taken seriously very early on in my life is just simply gone. Mm. And so the weakness of my worldview is that it doesn't feel like one. The, as far as, oh, what was the second one, Al? It says, what is the hardest thing, most difficult aspect of it in your daily life living? Well, this is why I forgot that second question. There's nothing difficult about it at all. Uh, in, in, in this sense, that um, it doesn't feel like a worldview. And I don't live a life standing in need of approval. So being in a position where it's clear that overwhelmingly the vast majority of the people around me personally and plenty of people around me culturally hold a different worldview is something I'm quite used to. And uh, even where I think that the difference of position is something that's incorrigible and can't ultimately be settled, or even where it appears to be a difference about just what the facts are, um, I'm, still, I, I, I'm used to being in a situation of having the people around me reject my worldview. And I don't look outward to them for approval on it. Mm -hmm. That makes it easy. Thank you. Professor Sue, what do you find is the biggest weakness in your worldview? And what are the difficulties you have in living it out in your daily life? Uh, I would say the, the weak, the weak um, sorry, what was the question? The biggest weakness the biggest of your weakness. worldview. Yes, I, I would say the biggest weakness in, in my worldview is also the, the part that's hardest to live out, and that is um, that I say I follow uh, a God who is loving, but I'm not always loving. Um, I say that I believe in a God uh, who values me with fundamental dignity, 
but I um, am just as tempted by these idols of achievement, money, power, success. Um, and that's, um, that's troubling, but it's also part of the, part of the, uh, the Christian struggle. It's, is, is, it's not that you believe something and then your life is all neatly tied up in a bow. I mean, my, um, when my mother was dying, and that honestly was the biggest thing that helped me see that I, I'm not independent. I need, um, I need God. Uh, I don't understand some of the big questions about suffering. Um, why my mother is suffering? What is the what is the meaning of this? Um, and so, wrestling with that is 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 part of the Christian struggle. And so, then becoming a Christian didn't suddenly make everything great, um, it, but it, it provided me with uh, uh, resources to understand why suffering is, is part of the human condition, uh, why Jesus offers hope. Um, and so becoming a Christian is not a one-time decision, it's a decision uh, every day to live under the cross, so to speak, to, to follow Jesus, but that's hard. Thank you. Thank you both for your comments and um, meaningful answers to those, those difficult questions. Now we're ready to take questions from the audience. I'd ask our assistants to come and assist with the microphones. You see the text number on the screen behind me, so feel free to start texting in questions that you may have. Um, one thing I would like to ask is that you succinctly and respectfully pose your questions to one or both of our speakers today. There are microphones that will be passed around, so if you um, raise your hand or get, get the attention of the, of the assistants, we will take the first question. Looks like there's a question in the can back. I text you a question? Yes, do it, do it. Don't need the microphone. what you said, it seems like you were originally not a Christian. That's correct. I did not grow up in a Christian home. That's a great question. I guess I, um, so my, my family was, uh, I, I guess I would describe my mother as agnostic and my father as atheist. Um, I had, I grew, uh, my parents, prizing education, sent us to the best school that they thought uh, uh, existed in our little hometown. And that was a Catholic uh, parochial school. And uh, I would say that um, the education there was great. Um, I guess I probably developed an appreciation for the numinous, the, 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 the sense that there might be something out there, something more than just the physical reality. Um, I did not, I was not a believer uh, at the time. I, um, I think I was one of those people who when I was in trouble I would, I would pray <laughs> and, then, and then otherwise God was just nowhere to be seen in, in, in my thinking. Um, and so I think what changed when I went to college was that I, I, I met Christians who I felt were living life differently. And of course I met people from lots of different faiths as well, but um, in particular I um, felt that, that the Christians that I met um, had a, a resource uh, that I was curious about. Um, I uh, when my Christian friends explained the concept of grace, it, it totally didn't make sense to me. It offended me. I mean, I am like, you know, I'm trying to be the top math student. You're telling me my accomplishments don't, aren't what make me worthy or, you know, good people. So, okay. So there's this caricature of Christians uh, that Christians are, um, just w wanna change the way people live. And unfortunately, there are um, uh, many examples of, of Christians who um, I would say are, are not, are, are, are being more a religious moralist than a Christian. So there's, I think, maybe a good way to think about it, there are, there's the non-religious, there are the religious, and then maybe there's a third way. And this idea of grace is such a big concept. It, it completely destroys and upends um, this idea that you have to earn your way. 
And so when these non-Christian, when these Christians explained the concept of grace, I guess I realized that it was different than a lot of other worldviews in that respect. Um, I have to say I, I did not do an extensive study of these other religions, and um, I, it was enough for me at the time when I gave my life to Christ, having not even read the Bible, just to say, God, if, if you're out there, um, show yourself to me. I will follow you. Um, and I was pretty sure that if God wasn't real, then I would know pretty quickly. Thank you. Here's a <coughs> question on the far side. Um, if we could get somebody to help with the microphone on that side, that would be helpful. But go ahead if you want to give it a try. Well, early on in my childhood, uh, I grew up in a very religious household. Um, and, uh, I tried doing it and uh, couldn't make any sense of the underlying theology. It just, it just didn't make any sense to me. Um, of course, that's part of the routine where you're supposed to in some way fall back on faith when you don't understand things. Uh, I don't operate that way, though. I perfectly fine not having answers, but I thought that what was offered as answers weren't answers at all. What was offered as comfort wasn't any comfort to me, and uh, I don't feel that I needed any definite answers. I was much, uh, I, I, I found myself mainly in a position of just not having any commitments for a while. After a while, taking stock of that, that took hold. And what that meant was, I just don't think that any of this stuff exists. Whatever it is that's, that amounts to an itinerary of factual or quasi-factual commitments within the scope of religion about the nature of the universe, I don't think those are true. Uh, it's not that I replace it with something else, because science doesn't deliver truth. So uh, science doesn't offer anything like a counterpart to religion. It's a completely different thing. And uh, that, in a way, makes it possible for people to be scientific and religious. But whatever it is that I took to be a basic commitment, such as the commitment to miracles, the commitment to any kind of over, overriding purpose, the commitment to uh, anything like a designed order, I just believe are false. Philosophy offers methods for investigating and articulating these commitments. The bulk of the history of philosophy provides answers that are very different from the ones that I am articulating. Um, but, uh, so I don't look for philosophy to somehow fill in a new answer on this. But it does give me the methods for uh, assessing reasoning and for determining what kind of uh, framework a given type of answer falls into. So my commitment to philosophy is not a replacement to religion at all, but just uh, a further development of my own native skills. I'm very well familiar with how philosophers have tried to make sense of uh, commitment to gods that aren't like what you get in Sunday school. And those commitments I don't buy into either. Thank you, Pro Professor Brown. We had a question texted in for Dr. Sue. The question is, if we retain dignity from, with failure, then what motivates us and why? So um, I guess maybe, so first of all, I appreciate the question. I think um, failure is uh, something that can be very um, um, hard. It can be very uh, demoralizing. Um, I've certainly had my own share of failure. Um, I guess I would say that failure is also an opportunity for great growth. I think failing is part of what education, what happens in education when you learn something. You try out a new idea, you see if it uh, makes sense, and if it doesn't, you struggle with it. It's true in mathematics. You, you um, professional mathematicians like myself, we. Um, we work on a hard problem, sometimes for years, and we get nowhere with it. We wouldn't be in this business if we weren't constantly failing at what we do. 
in our research. I mean, this is just true for almost any other, any research profession. So um, I think students uh, often have the mistaken impression that it's only the successes that matter. So I, I would say failure is an opportunity for growth. Um, and so to the question, I guess the question was, what's the motivation for doing anything? Well, I guess what the, the, the claim I'm making is that um, if you free yourself from this idol of achievement, then you have the freedom to do something, uh, to, to, do, to do things and try them on and, fa and fail at them. Um, and that means you're free to learn something. And then I guess the other point is that why would you want to learn something? Well, it turns out if, if I believe, if the universe is just a cold, uh, unyielding reality and there's no, um, uh, nothing that I can, can truly stake my life on that is eternal, um, then it is meaningless and there would be no point to learning anything. But the, the, the truth behind the, the, the universe to me is a person and that person can be known and that person actually loves me. I mean, that's amazing. And this person's created mathematics in all its beauty and wonder and glory. And I know some of you don't see math that way. Um, uh, this, is the, this is a person who um, uh, shaped um, the, the universe and it's worth understanding. The person who created human beings and all their, their complexities. Um, so it, it's, it's exciting to study now and I can study it without fear of failure. And still fail, but but not uh, worry about it. Thank you, Professor Sue. Are there any other questions? Now, would it be okay if I yes, throw please. A thought in on that because that does cut into some of the issues that I was talking about, and also uh, much of what you're saying is something that uh, I agree with in this form. That I, I see that um, the presumption that somehow or other you must set up a high bar of success and absent aiming for that thing and thinking that that's where you've got to go, you have no further motivation for acting or even striving. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are uh, plenty of grounds for thinking that that is writing its own recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're setting up for yourself not the conditions for success, but the, condi but the conditions for failure. You can reconceive the consideration uh, of why you're acting in an entirely different way. You're trying to explore who and what you are in the conditions under which you exist, where you appear to have certain abilities that you might wish to push forth and develop. Along the way, what other people consider to be failure is going to be par for the course in developing yourself. Your motivation in this sense is to find out who and what you are. Now, that statement right there is very easily and naturally attached to a much larger picture of a transcendent reality like you very smoothly put into your picture. Um, but I do think there's another way of framing it, and this is an issue about preference, and you did express your position in terms of preference there. But looking at it the other side, um, I look at the world and say, maybe it is a cold and unyielding reality, but it sure seems nice and warm around here. And even if there is no transcendent reality, the people around me who are wondering the same thing are still around me, whether there is or isn't that transcendent reality. And this reality is something I can investigate and explore whether or not there is this transcendent thing. In which case, on the assumption that there isn't that thing, I still have all the same reason for investigating it. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. In fact, there's a, a slightly related question for Dr. Brown that was texted in. And this question is, do you think there is such a thing as human dignity? And if so, where does it come from? It comes from ourselves. You create it yourself. You don't create it whole cloth. We grow up in a world learning about human failures and human achievements, learning about human types, learning about human experiences. We uh, try to figure out what the world is like. What is our dignity? Well, I think it's whatever it is that you appropriate to yourself as your values about yourself as you face these problems. It, in that sense, dignity is a created concept. Maybe the grace ought to come from yourself. By the way, I just want to ask. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think there's a lot that you and I agree on. Mm -hmm. um, I I wonder um, with with a dignity that comes from yourself, mm -hmm. how how do you make sense of competing claims? So if if I'm captured by 
ISIS, and they want to behead me. Um, and they think I don't have dignity, and I think that I do. Who, who's to say who's right? And is there some moral claim that can be made there that would speak to that situation? These are the kinds of problems that I very much like putting my students in the middle of. Mm. And what I like to do <laughs> is, <laughs> I'm a philosopher after all, and what I like to do is present competing outlooks on this that are alien to their own sentiment. Mm. So the issue about facing torture is something that the two ancient philosophies that I was talking about both address, Epicureanism and Stoicism. Mm. So um, I face this problem thinking that those outlooks give us interesting ways of um, facing trouble without assuming anything like a transcendent reality. The Stoics did think there was a god, but they were pantheists. They basically identified God with nature. So that certainly would be definitely on the opposite side of a view that says that our dignity is found in what we are in relation to a transcendent reality. The Epicureans, on the other hand, are functionally equivalent to atheists. They believe that there are gods, but their conception of God doesn't fit anyone else's conception of God. Okay, so on that account, you have two competing outlooks about this problem. Um, with respect to the Stoics, their framework, which I find really valuable in this sense, is to distinguish what is up to you and what's not. What's up to you is your own opinions and your own way of managing yourself and what you put value on. If you're in that kind of a situation and you're being tortured, someone is trying to, in this way, twist your arm. What are they doing? They're manipulating your body. It's entirely up to you to decide whether your body is something you're gonna treat as yours. If you treat it as not yours, then they can hurt it all you want. But what you have to do in that case is recognize that what's truly valuable is something inside the body. And what is that thing? Well, this commits us to some, com to some form of psychology. This psychology could attach itself to a transcendent reality. You could very well call it an immaterial soul or something like that. But I don't think you need those concepts to say that who and what I am is not this body. You can cut off various pieces of it, and if I can still identify what I am in reference to that, I don't need a transcendent reality to be the carrot in front of me to drive me. Thank you. Yeah. The upshot of that is your conception of values is going to shift. They're not delivered to you. Thank you. Back to the audience. We have a, a person up here. Is the microphone? Okay. Question is, I kind of see mathematics, philosophy, and religion as all being the pursuit of truth. Would you agree with that? I would say they are all on a pursuit for truth. That's correct. I would say that maybe different kinds of truth. I think um, mathematical truth is never going to give you um, make any uh, moral claims. Um, it's not. It's not going to answer uh, the the ought question. Ought I move cross country? Ought I go to this school? Mathematics isn't going to answer that question. But mathematics is very effective at, at modeling um, the, the the physical world. I'm a philosopher, so I could very well just ask what is truth, but, um, <laughs> and furthermore, whatever it is that you say that a given philosopher may think philosophy is, there's going to be a wealth of other philosophers who say it isn't that. So uh, there's no single answer as to what philosophy amounts to, so I wouldn't put pursuit of truth in that domain. Um, as far as what mathematics pursues, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a Platonist, so I would look at mathematics as a construct. Um, and that probably isn't a surprise. Um, as far as whether religion is a pursuit of truth, I would say it's a pursuit of a certain conception of what they may take as truth depending on what the religion is. But what that truth ultimately amounts to is something uh, that's not compelling to me. then do you believe in absolute truth at all? Um, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put it this way, there are plenty of absolute falsehoods. I think that's as good as we can get. Thank you. I think we have time for probably one more question. Do we have an audience member that's ready to ask? There is. 
Thank you. Um, this question is actually for both of you. I'm kind of curious to see how your opinions might differ. Um, I'm curious about your view of humanity in general, how you see people as far as their capacity for good or evil, um, not necessarily as educators, but just as fellow humans, um, and whether that opinion is based on your worldview or just your life experience. I missed the, la the second part of that question. Um, you, whether your opinion is based on your religious or worldviews, or whether it's just off of your life experience. I couldn't hear that. I'll let you answer it, and then I'll know what okay, you so, Did you get it? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a weird echo in, in the okay. um, rooms. Yeah. My, the, the question was, uh, how do we look at humanity in general, and to what degree or in what way is that outlook on humanity in general connected to what we would call our worldview? Is that fair? Um, I see, and, and you wanted to know it in terms of concepts like good and bad. Is that right? Oh, okay, I, I thought I got that out of your initial question. If not, then good, because my uh, answer is I don't look at human beings and, uh, and find anything to generalize about value. So are human beings fundamentally good? Uh, I have no idea. Um, I doubt it. Uh, <laughs> I would doubt that I'm good, but <laughs> the, the um, general outlook I would have about humanity is that the way I look at that question is either psychologically or biologically, and nothing more. So that definitely is shaped by my worldview. Thank you. Dr. Sue. I would say that um, when, I, when I think about humanity, that it is both humans are both uh, inherently um, uh, I hesitate to use the word sinful because people don't necessarily know what that means. I guess we're, we're, we're capable of, of a lot of great harm and we're also capable of a lot of great good. Um, and I don't see those, the, the fact that those two things are, con are contradictory, just like I don't see that, I don't have any problem with saying that humans are a bunch of bio, biochemical mixtures of things, as well as saying humans are, are moral agents who who can make decisions. So um, when I say that hum humanity is sinful or capable of great harm, we, we just see the effects of that. So on this point, I agree with Ken, uh, as Ken greatly here. But I also see that we're made in the image of God. I'm coming back to this because um, we're also capable of great good. And I think um, we should all be seeking the flourishing, but especially I think Christians should be seeking the flourishing of society uh, and um, because we're, uh, we have um, uh, some, I think, adequate knowledge of our limitations, um, we have resources that I think um, can help us seek the flourishing of humanity. So I, I have a dual view of, of, uh, of humanity. Thank you. Well, I'd like to let the audience members know that um, the speakers will be available in the foyer after the presentation, and um, you're welcome to come and ask them questions individually at that time. Professor Ken Brown and Professor Francis Sue, we would like to thank you both for your presentations and dialogue tonight. In order to conclude our discussion, I'd like to offer you each a couple minutes to provide kind of a wrap-up or concluding remarks to the audience. Professor Brown, would you like to go first? Sure. I think it's kind of interesting that we have this particular talk in this particular setting framed in the following way. A Christian and an atheist discuss topic X, and yet what we're talking about is something that is not too far apart, plenty of room for agreement. Mm -hmm. The worldview question is an important question, but it's not something that divides us on these fundamental issues. It's instead something that shows that, that an educational system like this can have many people come to it and get something out of it. And so uh, there are going to be other topics where we divide, and we saw a few of them. 
but they don't hit this issue about the, the importance and value of education. Thank you. Professor Sue. Um, first of all, I want to say I think this has been a fun conversation, stimulating conversation. I, um, I guess I would agree with Ken in, in, in many respects. I think our, our conversation has been wide ranging because we've been talking about big questions that impact education. Um, and it, it may be the case that within educational circles, we're, we're, um, we live in a, in, a, in a very special place in the university. University is a place where people are able to have, hopefully, gracious dialogue about things they agree with and disagree with. I would say when you look at the world, it's not necessarily the case. And when you get out uh, into the world, you realize that people do have different, vastly different philosophies, and it leads to great conflict. And uh, when you wrestle with that, um, you come to terms with a lot of, of questions. So for instance, if you are uh, a, you live in America, um, you know, we Christians believe that God is a God of both grace and justice. And um, the people in America like the forgiving part of God, but they don't like the, the part, uh, the, the, the part that, that God, that, that uh, the just part of God that says that sins should be punished. Um, but if you go to a, a culture in which violence happens every day, then the forgiving part of God is the part that will offend you. Because you say, my gosh, all these people are being killed and they're being left in the streets and who's gonna do anything about it? The, an idea of a God that's forgiving is, is uh, perhaps um, not, not the part that uh, you would resonate with. Now, of course, the thing that, that makes this uh, amazing is that God can be a God of justice and a God of grace and forgiveness because of Jesus, because uh, Jesus paid the price for the sins of the world, you can have a God who is at the same time just and at the same time looks at you and say, hey, you know what? Your moral accomplishments don't matter. Your uh, achievements don't matter. I love you no matter what. And it's because Jesus uh, makes that possible. So I would, I would just say that um, if, 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 these, if that idea, that fact somehow intrigues you, explore it, study it. Explore the big questions. Find people who will exhibit grace to you and, um, and experience that. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Well, you've been a, a wonderful, lively, and engaging audience tonight. So thank you all for coming out and um, sharing the evening with us. And let's give our two speakers a warm welcome. And Round of applause. Thanks, it was a really good night. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.